Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the Power Hour. God bless you for coming to worship with us and uh, uh, taking a chance on the experience that you'll have in this place to encounter God in a beautiful way. I want to say to our sister that just finished singing right now that the courage one has to fulfill their duty despite of what is happening is what God needs today. So whatever it is that's going on, let the words you've said be a blessing unto yourself. So thank you for coming in spite of everything. Amen? Amen. This morning, we continue our series, Becoming More. Becoming More. I'm going to go straight into the theme or the title of the message today. And the title is, When More is Too Much. I know it sounds like a contradiction. For me to say, we need to become more, but then for me to turn around and say, we should also know when more is too much. I am going to illustrate what this looks like through the passage of scripture that we're going to read together. So without further ado, let's go into the text for this morning, which is Acts chapter 8. Now something interesting happened on Wednesday when I made the mistake of meeting up with Pastor Henry because one thing we do is when we are preparing for a sermon series, we tell each other what the theme is, but we don't tell each other what we're going to preach. It just so happened that we were working on the same passage of scripture. So, Pastor, here's a challenge, man. While I'm going to go ahead and preach on the text, I want you to do the same. All right? N no? Did I put you on the spot right here? Don't, don't, don't take away what the Lord has put on your heart to give to the saints. All right. My man, Acts chapter 8, I want to read from verse number 1 all the way down to verse number 13. I'm reverting back to the translation that I'm comfortable with because of the words that it uses, the New Living Translation. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 8, I'm sorry, I'm going to read from verse number 1. Saul was one of the witnesses as he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Stephen, or Stephen, depending on what language you're using to pronounce that name, when you say Stephen, Pastor Andrew, what do you think of? Sorry. All right, man. The first human being or man or person to die for the cause of the gospel, as recorded in the scriptures, is Stephen. He was a deacon that was elected to handle the business, the day-to-day -day business of the church, but he also had the gift of speech. And so he, he stands before the Sanhedrin and challenges them. The same way, as we spoke about last week, that John and Peter challenged the Sanhedrin, Stephen does the same. But unlike the apostles, we are told that Stephen is stoned. Amongst the people that were stoning him, Saul was carrying the clothing or the garments of the men that stoned Stephen. It is after the death of Stephen where the enemy of the gospel has become so courageous and confident that now he has resorted to murder. This is where we are in the text. A great wave of persecution began that day sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Skip over to verse number four, and we'll keep reading. But, in spite of the persecution, but, in spite of the murder of Stephen, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. And verse number 8 says, so there was great joy in that city. 
The King James Version begins verse 9 by saying, but, but the NLT just begins by saying, a man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a very long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Verse number 13. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles that Philip performed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Somebody say amen. amen. As I said last week, the book of Acts is an amazing book because somebody said in actual fact, when you look at the way the Bible is divided, the first four books of the New Testament technically should be in the Old Testament. Because the New Testament church starts in the book of Acts. But the four Gospels are a fulfillment of everything the prophets said about Jesus. So technically, those four Gospels should come after Malachi. But we appreciate that they are in the New Testament because we need Jesus to be pulled into our time so that we can appreciate his work. But when you get to the book of Acts... While Jesus is the head of the church, we see that it is the spirit that is running the church. The spirit does not run the church the way that we do. We look at talent, we look at influence, we look at power, we look at prestige, but the spirit looks at the heart. When the spirit chooses a man or a woman to use, he does it in a way that the results speak for themselves. We see the 11 apostles plus Paul and all these other men and women, boys and girls, that joined the cause. They became more since the day of Pentecost. In the beginning of the book, we see the main actors or the players are the disciples who are now the apostles, the 11, the one who people come from outside Jerusalem to come and listen to. We see Philip being amongst them as a preacher. The Bible is very clear with what Jesus intended for the church to be. Jesus never intended the church to be a congregation. He intended it to be a movement. And when the church begins to settle, God allows chaos. God allows issues. God allows persecution to come in because the only way we can stand up is when we sit on something hot. Nothing hits up a Christian like persecution, rejection, false accusation, attack on your reputation, an attack on your family, your finances, your job, your place in the family. That's how God gets us up to do his bidding. And so the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, Stephen is dead and more bodies are about to drop. And so people begin to flee Jerusalem because they don't want to die just yet. But I love the text because it says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 that while everybody else was leaving, the disciples did not move. Because if they moved, people would become discouraged. Because if the top dogs are not standing up, what do the rest of us do? And so the disciples said, we are willing to go the way that Jesus went. We will stay right where we are. Everybody else leaves town. They go to the surrounding places. And the Bible says that Philip chooses, pardon me, the Holy Spirit moves him to go to Samaria. We've read the text. Let me read a statement. Becoming more means living an, in, an interrupted life in an... In, I'm sorry. Let me come closer. Let me back up and rewind. Becoming more means living an interrupted life in an uninterrupted way. Does that make any sense? Here's the reality about the lives we lead today. It is easy for a preacher to get up on the stage, read a passage of scripture where people were willing to suffer for Jesus more than 2,000 years ago. 
It's difficult for somebody sitting in the audience thinking about the mess of their life and being able to relate. So I'm not here disconnected from what you're going through and saying to you, suck it up, preach about Jesus. I'm saying, let's learn from them that in spite of being rejected, threatened, and even murdered, these people refused to allow the interruptions of life to interrupt how they lived every day. They refused for somebody else to dictate the conscience that they operated in the world. They refused to give up on their hopes and their dreams and their desire to honor God just because some man was too proud to accept Jesus. They said, fine, you don't want us in Jerusalem. We will go where we need to go, but we are not going to stop talking about Christ. So one more time, I know that the devil is interrupting your life. In fact, uh, thank you that most of you are not wearing masks right now. I'm looking at your face and I, all I see is Monday to Friday. <laughs> I just see Monday to Friday. Notice I didn't say Sunday because Sunday y'all go watch movies, play golf and have a good time. But Monday to Friday is weighing you down right now. Now think about it. You're dealing with Monday to Friday. These people were dealing with, am I going to see Monday or Friday? But they decided whether I get fired whether I get a diagnosis that is terminal, whether my loved ones die, whether divorce is knocking at the door, I refuse to live an interrupted life. Amen, somebody. Amen. And so the Bible says that Philip goes to Samaria, and, and, and this is not the first time that somebody has gone to Samaria. If there's anybody who has demonstrated the power of living an uninterrupted life, is Jesus Christ. In fact, not only did Christ get interrupted, he welcomed it and walked directly into it. Because Jesus had mastered the art of protecting his growth zone while getting out of his comfort zone. Jesus' comfort zone was preaching to Jews, his own people. But now and again, he would wander outside and speak to foreigners, the, Samar the Samaritans. He'd go outside. That was dangerous. Because in those days, a Jew could not wander into Samaria because they thought Samaritans were unclean people. They would rather spend more time going around the region than go through it. But Jesus, being Jesus, decided, this is me. I'm a disruptor. I'm going into Samaria. That's the first level. He goes to a well, starts to talk to a woman by himself. That's another level of disruption. Not only is she a woman, but she is a woman who is questionable. She has been with five men. In fact, the man she's with now is not even her husband. But Jesus says, that's cool. I'm still going to talk to her another level. Jesus lived outside of his comfort zone. My brothers and sisters, in spite of your Monday to Friday, I want you to know something. You have become so accustomed to Monday to Friday that the devil has you in a comfort zone. For some people, the comfort zone is a good job. For some people, the comfort zone is not progressing with your studies. For some people, the comfort zone, uh-oh, is staying single. I'm sorry. I apologize for that one. That was uncalled for. For some people, the comfort zone is chaos. For some people, the comfort zone is bad relationships. For some people, the comfort zone is habits that hold you prisoner. But you're so used to the chaos, it has become a comfort zone. So what God does, he sends somebody, something, an experience, a circumstance to light a fire under, under you so that you can get out of your comfort zone into your growth zone. Pastor, what is a growth zone? I'll tell you. Thank you for asking. Your growth zone is the place where you learn something new. And listen to me. It is hard for the devil to keep up with you when you choose on your own to get out of your comfort zone into your growth zone. He can't touch you. What else can he do to you? You've left home. You jumped on a plane with a one-way ticket to a country that requires a two-way ticket. What can he do to you? He sends sickness and disease and tries to kill your son. What can he do to you? The devil can get you content with protecting your comfort zone. What is your comfort zone? Some of you, when you come to church, I can bet a billion rupiah that you're going to sit in the same chair Saturday after Saturday. I can predict where you eat lunch on a Tuesday and where you eat dinner on a Thursday. 
Because your life is such a routine. Even your wife knows what you're going to say in the morning. Even you know the moment you get from work, what she's going to complain about, what friends she's going to talk about, and this, that, what is new, what's on sale, what's a promotion, yada, yada, yada every day. Comfort zone. But the devil says, you know what? I'm going to send you a workmate that's going to be so jealous of you that they're going to cause problems in the office. I'm going to send some church members who don't know how to pray for you, but know how to talk about you. I'm going to make you uncomfortable in your church so you can come and worship at JCC. Amen, somebody. <laughs> to a certain extent, the devil has no problem with belief and joy. He gets uncomfortable with losing territory. Let me break this down. Philip is in Samaria. The Bible says he begins to preach. Jesus was there. He converted a woman in one conversation. And while she was a pariah, while she was an outsider, she gained courage from meeting Jesus. She goes into the city and the Bible says everybody came with her and they spent two days with Jesus. That's in John chapter 4. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 8, things have become different. Because like I told you, people become comfortable with the with a comfort zone. Jesus was here. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 8, the city is being run by a sorcerer, by a man named Simon, who is, in fact, he's called Simon Magus. And I want you to understand that this man's influence extends way, way beyond Samaria. There's somebody by the name of Justin Mata, who happens to be one of our church fathers, in fact, his works and writings are so prominent and important even in our time today. Justin Mata was actually a resident of Samaria after 100 CE, AD, whatever it's called. He says in his writings that Simon the sorcerer was not only influential in Samaria, but in actual fact, there was a statue of Simon in Rome that the people in Rome honored him not just as a sorcerer, but as a god. So I want you to understand how powerful this man is. Philip comes into town, starts to talk about Jesus, starts to perform miracles, and the Bible says that people began to believe and there was joy. Because if there's no belief and no joy because of the preaching of the gospel, something is wrong. Right. It's either the messenger is flawed or the people listening are not listening. The preaching of Jesus Christ should bring joy in your life. Well, why is it that the preacher is the one saying, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm? Well, why are you here? What have you come for? But not to confirm and establish your belief, or at least find joy in the midst of your Monday to Friday. So, one more time the preaching of the gospel should increase belief and bring joy. Because without those two things, the devil is winning. The Bible says in Samaria that the, the city, the city that had been held bound by Harry Potter, I'm sorry, by Simon the Sorcerer, has now found Jesus and has found belief and found joy. The devil has no problem with joy. He has no problem with belief. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, says the devils believe and tremble. The devil does not have a problem with you believing. The devil doesn't even have a problem with you being joyful. What he doesn't want is losing territory. He does not want to lose a hold of a region. In fact, when you read the Gospels again in Mark chapter 5, we are told that Jesus went into the region of the Gadarenes. He took out a demon from a demoniac and the demon said to Jesus, please allow us to go into the pigs. And then the pigs went into the water. See, the devil doesn't want to leave the region. He doesn't mind if mommy believes in Jesus Christ, but husband cannot. He doesn't mind if mommy and daddy come to church, but as long as he's got the kids, he still has territory. The devil can have everybody, but one person, he's still there. He doesn't mind you coming to the house of God for worship, as long as after you're done, you go do what you do. He doesn't mind you standing up here and preaching and singing and giving and sharing and smiling at the door as long as he has every other day. What days? Monday to Friday. 
He doesn't mind you believing. He doesn't mind the joy. But as long as he can hold you captive, because when you leave this place, he wants to remind you, hey, don't forget, you got maxed out credit cards. Hey, don't forget, you are unhappy at home. Hey, don't forget, nobody likes you at work. Hey, don't forget, you have a notice because you're about to lose your job. The devil wants to hold you by the throat even when you're sitting in this place. That's why we are saying you need to become more. Amen, somebody. Amen. We cannot allow the devil to keep making us until our comfort zone is just a square by square experience. If the story had ended with Simon the magician being baptized, then we'd say, Great story, we go home. But that's not how the story ends. Get your Bibles. Let's read verse 14 to verse 19. Philip has preached. People have given their lives to the Lord. People have been baptized. People have confirmed their faith in Christ and not in witches and goblins and zombies and such. Verse 14 says... When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John over there. As soon as they arrived, the Bible says they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them because it is possible to believe and have joy but not have the Spirit just yet. The Bible says, then Peter... And John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Next scene, enter Simon. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, I'm about to step on some toes. He offered them money to buy this power. And this is what he said. Let me have this power too, so that when I lay hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter... The one who spoke before he thought. But Peter, the one who was not afraid to offend, replied and said to him, May your money be destroyed with you for thinking that God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and I held captive by sin. And then Simon said what all of us say when somebody calls us out. Verse 24. Pray for me that these terrible things that you have said won't happen to me. It's about to get rocky now. Those who become more in what they do are wise enough to invite others to do it with them. Philip has preached in Samaria. Philip has turned a wicked city upside down. Philip has replicated the power of Christ in a way that has drew everybody, including the attention of a sorcerer. Philip has done his part. He has converted a city by the power of the Spirit. But notice what happens. Reinforcements are sent for in Jerusalem. Peter comes to Samaria. If Peter and Philip were pastors today, they would not be willing to share the stage. They'd be more concerned about their rise in the organization rather than serving God. But these men knew that becoming more meant learning when to step aside. Philip steps aside. He lets Peter come in, lay hands on people, and they receive the Holy Ghost. Paul says, some sow, some reap, some harvest, but everybody gets involved in the work. There's a problem in the church today. There are more church members, more congregations, more denominations than ever before. More people are coming to the Lord. And yet, we see the spirit of jealousy. We see the burden of bitterness breaking up the house of the Lord. How does the spirit come and use us when we can't figure ourselves out right now? Philip said, it is not enough for me to do this. I need the OG to come to town. And so Peter begins to lay hands on the people and they receive the spirit. Now Simon has been following. 
Philip for a while, he's been observing him. He, he saw blind eyes open. He sees the lame walking again. He sees people's uh, sad s- smiles turn into uh, joy. He sees meh become happiness. He sees all this going on. And in his mind, he's thinking, I need me some of this. This is way stronger than what I've done. They've called me the power of God. They called him the power of God. No, they didn't say he has the power of God. They called him the power of God. But now he has lost his, his, his credibility. He's lost his influence. And so he says to himself, you know what? Let me get baptized so I can get access. And the Bible says he believed, but his belief was based on what he saw, but not what he experienced. And so he says to himself, let me get baptized so I, get, I can get access. The Bible says that for Peter's, Peter's laying hands on the people. And then Simon comes up. I, I don't know where he got the nerve. He comes up to, to Peter and says to me, listen, man, listen, listen, listen. I got some money right now. If you take this money, you give me this power, we, we square. We good. Any other preacher would have been like, you know what? We do need the offerings. We are running low on the evangelism budget. We do need to hire more preachers. I'll take the money. But Peter said, you and your money can burn. It's not enough to be impressed. You must be possessed. A lot of people come to church to be impressed, not to be possessed. Some people will say, Pastor, ah, the sermon today wasn't as powerful as last week. Do you know what they mean? What they mean is you didn't excite me you provoked me, and you insulted me. Pastor, you, you didn't seem like you, were, you, you, you had it today, but we'll see next week. Because we want to be impressed, but not possessed. You are not here for the sermon. You are not here for the singing. You ought to be here for Christ. He is what matters. He is what matters. He is what matters. My wife and son are sick today, but I'm here because Christ matters. The word needed to be preached. Christ matters. We've been playing church for way too long. We've become so comfortable being in the basement, just getting by. Meanwhile, the devil is gaining ground outside more and more. People are past. how come, why is it that the world is so comfortable? Men are marrying men. Girls are calling themselves boys. I said, they're not the problem. We are. When you bypass possession and portion, you will assume you can exchange what you have acquired for what God requires. You cannot bring what you've gained through ill-gotten wealth. You cannot bring the influence you have on people outside and try to exert it in God's house because what you have doesn't matter. The question is, does God have you? The devil had Simon, not God. OG Simon says to fake Simon, you and your money can burn. Let's go back to where we started last week. Let's go back to where we started last week. Last week, the, ch- the, the, the framework was different. Here was God. And to be of God meant being possessed by Christ. I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. To be of God means to have a portion in the kingdom of heaven, to have an inheritance with the Father, to become sons and daughters of God, adopted by the Spirit. To be of God means to have a power that comes from above that changes not only how you think, but how you live, what you say, what you do. Here's the problem with self. Self wants to possess, but not to be possessed. Self wants a portion, but not a portion of what God has to offer. And self wants power. So Simon said, you know what? I do not want to be possessed. I do not want a portion. I want power. Preach to me, pastor. Tell me about Jesus. Monday to Friday has beaten my butt. I need some encouragement. Preach to me, pastor. I need a new job. I need a raise. I need a wife. I need a husband. I need a child. My child is sick. Preach to me, pastor. And then when the pastor says, give Jesus your heart and give me your hand. Ooh, slow down, man of God, slow down. I'm just here for power that I can use, but I don't want to be used by God. Do you know what is difficult? Pastor can attest to it. Do you know what is difficult? Is standing in front of an audience and preaching. Because people assume that you've figured it out. I wish somebody had said this to me when I turned 21. I wish some of the stuff that I preached today, somebody had said it to me when I was younger. Because when self takes over, there's nothing anybody can do until you are truly changed. 
Simon heard the gospel. He saw its power, but he still remained the same. He wanted power, but he did not want God. Power is what affects the soul. Let me, let me, let me, let me dump this sermon. Let me, let me get done. Verse 20 to verse 24. Peter responds and says, may your money be destroyed. Because you think that God's gift can be bought. And he says to him three things I want to leave with you today. In case you missed anything else I said. The reason why more can be too much is because you are holding on to some stuff. There are things in your life that are preventing God from doing the uttermost for you. Through you. There's so much that you want God to do. He's desperate to do it for you. But the problem is self is in the way. Your heart is not right with God. How does God give a preacher the power of the Holy Spirit when he's not right with God? How does God bless your business and your family and your life when you're full of bitter jealousy? If God gave you more, you'd use it to put pictures on Instagram. You wouldn't do it to honor him. How does God give you more when you are held captive by sin? The most dangerous thing in the world is the power of the Holy Spirit on a sinner. Your heart is not right with God. That means you're not possessed. You are full of bitter jealousy. That means you don't have a portion. Do you know sibling rivalry is caused by what in a home? It's caused by the fact that one of the children, or two, or 11, in the case of Joseph, think that the other one is more important than them. You are consumed by jealousy. You are the child. You are birthed. You share blood with your parents. But for some reason, you feel inferior because they honor this one because they have a job, a business. They are a doctor. They are a lawyer. They are whatever. But you are not that. And so you feel bitter jealousy. You are in the house, but you don't feel like you belong. God's people are the same. You are here to worship God, but we're looking at each other. And, hmm, look at her in those shoes. She thinks she's special. Those are from last season. <laughs> and so when self takes over, power's gone, portion is gone. All you have is yourself. That's why you sit in church with this uh, paranoid, suspicious look on your face, this bitterness and anger. You are not coming because you want to be found by God. You are coming because you are marking the register. You are hoping the preacher says something that can quiet your demons. The Bible says in the Old Testament that King Saul had the spirit of God on him. He used to prophesy. He was this tall, dark, and handsome man who was the first king of Israel, but later in the story, he succumbs to the devil. Saul would call musicians in to play music, not to remove the demon, not to remove the evil spirit, but to quiet it down. Some people are here not because they want God to change them. They just want God to help them with their demon. Pastor, I'm angry. Pastor, I'm depressed. Pastor, I'm paranoid. I don't trust my wife. I don't trust my husband. I'm going through his phone. I'm going through. I'm tracking him. I don't want to be that person. Help, help me quiet my demon. No, get rid of it. God is not interested in entertaining your demons. He wants you to get rid of it. He wants you to get rid of it. Turn to somebody and say, get rid of it. If you're talking to your partner, they know exactly what you're talking about. In conclusion, less of me, more of him, releases more than you can ever dream. We have been sitting by the sidelines. We have been sitting in the economy class while carrying first class tickets. We have a blank check and God says, write the number that you want, but we're not doing it because we are comfortable with our misery, with our secrets, with our pain, with our loss and our loneliness. We've become so comfortable with being sneaky and angry and gossipy and just bitter. And yet God says, I've got more, but you're not ready. So Peter said to him, go repent first, then come back. We'll see what we can do. I don't want you to do what Simon did. Simon said, pray for me. I'm tired of people saying, pray for me. Let's pray together. Let's, in fact, I'll teach you how to pray for yourself. I'll teach you how to wrestle with your demons. This, this week I had an opportunity to meet a friend who, who, who has had some struggles. I mean, real struggles. And, and the way that they share the things that they've been through and how God has saved them is like watching a YouTube video. They've been to the dark side. They've seen what it looks like to be a Simon. But now the, the, the freedom of being out of the spotlight, the freedom of not being popular anymore, and just having Christ is enough. Because Christ is 
enough. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm sorry if I preached at you. I just, I just want you to understand that we are holding back from receiving more because we want more of what God is not willing to give. Heavenly Father, here we stand. Here we sit with our heads bowed. Here we are before you, naked and exposed for what it is that we carry in our hearts and we cherish it more than we do Jesus Christ. We refuse to get off the throne because as long as you are at our mercy, we think we will get what we want. If we can't get it through you, we will do it through the church. We will do it through the leaders of the church. We will do it through the preachers. We will do it through our family members. We will do everything we can. And yet we will never quite get who you are. And so at this moment, Father, I'm, I'm praying with and for my brothers and sisters. And I'm saying to them, in order to become more, we need to get rid of the less. And the less is being weighed down by sin. It's being weighed down by bitter jealousy. It's being weighed down by being so distant from God that he can't do anything. It's not that God doesn't want to give us joy. It's not that God doesn't want to heal us. It's not that God doesn't want to bring peace in the home. It's not that God doesn't want to bless our work. It's not that God doesn't want to bless our children. It's that we are not right with him. And so, Father, we begin at the basement, at the basic level. Help us to be right with you. We can't do it by ourselves. We don't have the power. We don't have the possession. We don't have the portion. It is you. Thank you, Father, that you have said that each of us ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Thank you that you also said that it is you who works inside of us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure, which means we don't have to worry about the power. You will supply it the moment we get off the throne. I pray for somebody today who needs to be baptized. I pray for somebody today who wants to be baptized. I pray that their reasons for baptism is not because they see what God can do, but because they've seen what God has done. It's not because they want a blessing, but they know that God's presence is a blessing. It's not because they're waiting to be given access to something on this earth, but because they want access to something in heaven. It's not because they want access to a person or a thing, but because they want access to Jesus. If that person is seated in this room, I pray, Father, that they will not wait for sickness, that they will not wait for persecution, that they will not wait for problems to come up and give their hand to the Lord, that they will do it now while the season is quiet and peaceful, while they can process it from a place of reason, a place of logic, and a place of understanding what the Bible says. If there's somebody in this room who is struggling with deciding to be baptized, who has told themselves, it is enough that I'm in church. I don't need baptism. I'm here to tell you, my brother, my sister, God wants you to declare publicly your love for him because until then, you cannot become more. There's a parent who wants their child to be baptized, but I pray that the reasons for that baptism are of God. There's a young lady, a young man who wants to get married, but they want their partner to be baptized. I pray that it's not just for access to something, but it's access to Jesus. I pray, not because I'm worthy, but because Jesus is worthy. Christ saves, Christ heals, Christ is everything, and Christ is enough. If this is your belief, let me hear you say amen.